So welcome to one of the Healthy Landscapes Practical Regenerative Agricultural Communities webinars, Central Victorian Climate Today, Tomorrow and the Future. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank Macedon Ranger Shire Council, Hepburn Shire Council, City of Greater Bendigo, a healthy Colburn catchment, which involves North Central CMA and Colburn Water and Melbourne Water and Upper Compassity Land Care Network for their support of this program. But in particular tonight, I want to thank uh, the Bureau of Meteorology for allowing Felicity to, to talk tonight. Uh, just, just a quick plug for uh, upcoming events. The best place to start up to debt with this project is to log on to the Healthy Landscapes page at Masson Ranger Shire Council. A uh, reminder that we've got a small property grazing course starting on uh, February 18. If you want to um, look out for more of that, go to that website. We have property visits uh, available starting in February. And we've got more field days and workshops on water for your stock and moving uh, movable fence and water for your stock coming up in uh, February, March. Uh, so in starting, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners for, um, for me, it's the Jajarung people. And I wish to acknowledge them uh, and also anyone that's watching uh, this video or watching tonight and want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, emerging, whichever lands they come from. Uh, I also want to pay uh, uh, respect and acknowledge any Torres Strait or Aboriginal people that may be watching this or joining us tonight. And uh, thank you for being part of tonight. I will now hand over to Felicity um, as she explains that she's uh, the senior climatologist in, uh, and, and it's changed since we promoted. So uh, over to you, Felicity. Thanks, Jace. And just checking that you can see my um, shared screen there. Yes. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me along tonight. It's great to come and have a chat. Um, I've just been putting together this slide pack over the last few days, and um, we've actually had a few uh, new products released at the Bureau lately. So I've been and one that's about to be released, which I think is going to be a really exciting um, component um, of tonight's um, presentation. Um, so just pulling all these things together. So I've got quite a lot to, go, um, to get through. But what I'll do is I will share these slides with Jace afterwards. And they've all got the links to the various products that I talked to, the um, Bureau Outlooks and such. So you can go through them at another time, um, click on the links and, and do some exploring yourself. So I've been with the Bureau for um, almost 20 years now. So it's been a little while. I um, originally joined as a forecaster um, and then moved into our climate program a couple of years after that. Um, and as Jace just said, I've just actually moved into our new national security and space program, which is um, some work that we do with defence and um, DFAT and home affairs in terms of getting climate um, for strategic decisions in terms of national security. Um, so, which is a really exciting new role, but I still have a real love for um, how climate is used within agriculture, which is where I was prior. Um, I did a bit of work with Department of Primary Industries um, out of Tamworth for a little while where I um, took some leave without pay from the Bureau um, and worked with um, agronomists there in terms of how to use climate for decision making in um, the grains industry. So, let's see if I can change slides. There we go. So, um, this is my rough outline for the talk. So, we're going to have a quick chat about climate. Um, what drives our climate, particularly for Victoria. Um, we're going to look at um, the historical averages, recent conditions, the current outlooks, and then looking further afield into projections. So often when we start a talk and we don't really know what our audience knows, we do a quick outline of the difference between weather and climate or weather versus climate. I think our forecasters will often say that weather is exciting and climate is boring, but I think I'm, um, I don't agree with that, that definition. 
anyway, these are some things that I just pulled from the web today, just in terms of getting that um, that definition or getting that clarity between what is weather and what is climate. And there's some quite nifty graphics out there. So, um, you know, talking about climate is um, something that is what you expect, whereas weather is what you get. Um, and I quite like the wardrobe one too. Weather tells you what to wear each day, but climate tells you what types of clothes you've got in your in your in your closet. And the other one that I really quite like is that graph that shows, um, and this can also be applied to climate variability, um, but shows that climate is that sort of that fairly slow trend, whereas weather or inter um, year variability is that sort of wiggly path that the, that the dog takes as you go for a walk. So we're going to talk about um, climate outlooks, um, which is, um, represented in this graph by that purple um, sort of bit in the middle. So we're looking at um, the bottom part of this graph is the green weather forecast where we have the minutes to the hours, to the days, to the week. Then we get a bit of a crossover with the weeks, which is generally considered more um, climate outlooks um, and seasonal prediction as we go up through that purple um, purple part of that graph. And then as we get um, further ahead into the decades and um, centuries, um, we start to get into that orange level. And the white um, part of that graph that gets wider and wider as you get further into the orange section shows that forecast uncertainty. So in the green weather um, type scales, we have quite good certainty and we can say with quite um, good confidence what the forecast is going to be today and tomorrow and out to the next few days. By the time you get into the seasonal outlooks, there is greater uncertainty and, and even more as you get into the decadal um, and uh, longer projections. Um, and this graph just also looks at what those different forecasts, outlooks and projections can be used for. So um, when we look at what drives our climate for Australia, we there are quite a few um, different drivers. There are um, our what we call our primary climate drivers, and most people are very familiar with those. Um, and that's El Nino, La Nina, or the collective term El Nino Southern Oscillation. There's also the Indian Ocean Dipole, and that's a very similar um, in, in some ways, um, but instead of being driven by the Pacific Ocean temperatures, it's driven by temperature patterns in the Indian Ocean. Um, and even though they seem like they're far away, they can still have quite big impacts um, across Australia um, and um, certainly for Victoria. Um, but Victoria is also um, heavily influenced by the Southern Annular, annular Mode or slightly less of a mouthful is SAM, which is what we typically, typically call it. So SAM is down to our south. And when SAM is positive, it pulls the rain fronts further to our south. And we tend to see fairly dry conditions across Victoria. It does depend a little bit on what season it is. Um, but during a, a negative SAM, those fronts come further north. So they can also have an impact on our climate variability. And they're probably the main ones that we're going to talk about today. I've also put in that little diagram of um, the climate dogs that Dale Gray and his team put together, which are also um, great little schematics and videos of how to understand the influence of our climate drivers on our climate. And I'm sure you're all probably quite familiar with those, but that um, graphic does link to his page of climate videos. So, um, I thought I'd just do a quick rundown of what is currently influencing our climate. And many of you are, uh, are no doubt um, familiar with um, La Nina and have heard that the Bureau um, did declare a La Nina event underway um, a, a couple of weeks ago, I think two weeks exactly today. Um, so there's our little dial that shows that we are in a La Nina event. Um, now, the models indicate that this La Nina is likely to be fairly short-lived um, and reasonably weak. It's not looking like a really um, huge La Nina event like we saw back in 2010 to 2012. But having said that, it is coming on the back of a, another um, La Nina that we had this time last year. So we do already have reasonably wet soils. And then when you're having 
um, a second um, event, um, consecutive event, it means that those same areas that probably got reasonable rainfall over the last year are likely to see that rainfall again. So the fact that it's a back-to-back -back event um, means that it's still significant, even though it may be fairly short-lived and reasonably weak. The other thing to take into account um, looking at the strength of a La Nina is how those secondary drivers might be playing into it as well. So it's not just La Nina, um, as we saw in the previous diagram, there's also those other secondary drivers that can influence it, can either enhance that La Nina impact on our rainfall, or it can um, balance it out a little bit. So what we've also seen this year is a negative um, phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole, which also brings fairly wet conditions to Australia. And that's been in a negative phase for a couple of months now. It is returning to neutral, which it typically does as we head into summer. Um, but it is still having an influence on our rainfall in terms of enhancing our normal rainfall for this time of year. And then we have SAM in that positive phase at the moment. It's bringing the fronts further south, but what that does at this time of year is it allows a bit more moisture to come in from the east. And so we are seeing enhanced rainfall coming in off the east, affecting more um, the east coast, so um, New South Wales, eastern Victoria. And we have seen um, quite a lot of, um, a lot more um, onshore flow and rainfall associated with that. So we, we've got those three drivers all in their, their wet phase. And so that's why we've seen such a wet um, November in particular. And then underlying all of that, we've got our long-term trends. And um, everyone is familiar with that um, global warming trend. Um, in Australia, our climate has warmed by around one and a half degrees over the last um, century or so. But there's also um, an influence on our rainfall patterns too. And at this time of year, um, our, the northern wet season has um, typically sees enhanced uh, rainfall compared to what they would have seen a couple of decades ago. Um, for Victoria though, um, we've noticed a step change in recent decades to seeing drier than average conditions during, um, during the, the colder months. So um, the autumn and winter months and we'll, we'll have a little bit more of a look at that um, in future slides. Um, yep, so I've put the link there that goes into detail um, and gets updated every fortnight with the latest status of our drivers. Just a little schematic here, just in terms of explaining La Nina and what that means. This is a neutral phase, but during La Nina, we see that east-west circulation across the Pacific um, get even stronger, which means we see much more warm water pushed over to Australia. And as a result, it enhances rainfall across Australia. And we also actually see very dry conditions for islands in the Pacific, in the equatorial Pacific. So while we think of La Nina as bringing a lot of rain to Australia, it actually has very, um, very dry, uh, dry effect on those equatorial islands and often they do actually run out of water. So it's something that I was talking to Defence earlier today about um, because they have had to deliver water or mobile desalination units to some equatorial islands during previous La Nina events. So um, yeah, so there's obviously, it's not just Australia that gets impacted by La Nina, there are um, nations all around the world that also see impacts. But we'll just focus on Australia for tonight. So there um, on the right are listed the typical impacts that we see during a La Nina. So obviously that rainfall increases over much of eastern and northern Australia. Typically daytime temperatures are cooler than average as well due to that extra cloud and rain. We also see more tropical cyclones. And while you think, oh, well, we don't get cyclones down here, um, we can still get the impacts from ex-tropical cyclones. And in fact, back in 20. 11, I think, when there was major flooding in Kyneton, um, that was partly the result of an ex-tropical cyclone, I think it was Anthony maybe, that, um, that came down and just um, still had quite a lot of moisture left in it um, and did bring um, quite significant flooding, um, quite significant rainfall to the area. Um, obviously, the chance of widespread flooding is increased during La Nina um, and also heat waves um, are, um, tend to be longer. So we don't tend to see those spikes in heat, but we do tend to see prolonged heat, very humid heat as well, which can have um, quite significant impacts on human health. Um, 
All right, I might just keep moving. Um, so this is the southern annular mode. It's in a neg um, it's in a positive phase at the moment, which is what this video is describing, set, showing how those westerly winds that bring those rain systems to Australia gets brought south, and we get more onshore flow on the east coast. And you can see um, how we've got that those little wind arrows coming up over the coast and bringing with it extra cloud, extra rainfall. So when you have that combined with the La Nina signal, we end up with very wet conditions across Eastern Australia. So looking at historical averages, um, I just pulled this out very quickly from our website, um, but I, we have some much nicer ones than this. This is a very um, sort of stock standard. Um, but we look at um, the climate averages for, for various reasons. Firstly, just to get an idea of what's typical for a location. And then we can compare it to um, the most recent season or month or what have you. So we can determine whether it's an above or below average season and what that has meant in previous um, occasions as well. We also use these long-term averages um, to determine um, trends. So trends in rainfall, trends in temperature. And while I was looking at this, I, I happened across the January um, rainfall for Kyneton, which shows one particularly standout <laughs> month back in 2011. So, um, yeah, it must have been quite a significant um, uh, 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 month that, uh, um, uh, that year um, when that occurred. So I, I did have a little bit of a look into some of the, the impacts resulting from that. But you can see, you can see from this long-term record just how much above average and how much a, a month like that does stand out. Um, once again, all this is available on our website. So this is just a sample of some of the climate data that can be pulled um, off the web um, for various locations around Australia. Um, so this is for a site data. So there are certain sites that have um, longer records than others. Um, but I'll show you some other um, information a bit later on that has similar sorts of information, but on a gridded basis. So you can basically get it on a, um, for any location across Australia, not just at particular long-term sites. So I thought we'd take a quick look at recent conditions because it has been quite a significant uh, month, um, particularly November. Um, so you can see from this map, it shows um, rainfall deciles and that's putting what was observed during November just gone into the um, into a historical um, framework. So we can look at this and we can see um, that the areas in that dark blue colour are the highest on record. So we're looking at what values were recorded at those particular sites and how it compares to their historical record, which goes back to 1900. So um, across Australia, it was actually our wettest November on record. So the wettest in 122 years. So quite a wet November. Um, and New South Wales and South Australia also had their wettest November on record. Um, and it's something that we're um, talking very closely um, to emergency services and um, defence um, at the moment because it has raised the risk of, um, of widespread flooding to continue through the summer months, especially as water storages are also um, very high at the moment. We also saw very cold temperatures um, or much cooler than normal temperatures um, during, um, during November. Um, so you can see all those blues indicating um, very much below average daytime temperatures and some lowest on record. And this is this is a map that really stood out to us actually because typically um, just with recent warming trends, these maps are usually in those yellows and oranges. So it is quite an unusual map to see such widespread cooler than average temperatures. And this is just the three month um, rainfall deciles. So also giving us an indication of just how wet it's been over the last three months. We also keep an eye on soil moisture. So we've also um, got um, a link there to where you can um, bring up these maps for yourself. Um, and this one just um, I put in a comparison with this time last year and then the year before that. So we have seen quite um, a big contrast in years just in that 24 months. So obviously back in 2019, it was particularly dry across much of Australia. Um, and we also um, 
um, yeah, obviously that led to the um, very strong drought and bushfire, um, the Black, Saturday, uh, Black Summer bushfires. Um, last year, though, we were reasonably close to, to normal. And then this year, you can see that soil moisture across much of the country is above normal at the moment. Oops, I must have popped that. Oh, backwards. There we go. Um, and um, just to yeah, reinforce that, that wet message, um, that we are seeing very high um, levels in all our, well, not all, but majority of our water storages. So these circles all represent various water storages across Australia. The blue means they're at greater than 80% capacity. And the size of the circle is, is how big those water storages are. So um, very full water storages, very wet soils, lots of recent rainfall, high um, river levels means that we are likely to see the, um, more flooding as we head into summer. Um, this one looks in particular at the Murray-Darling Basin. The one that I do like to draw attention to is the, the Murray-Darling Basin Northern region. So all the water storage is within that region. And you can see it's currently at 90.7% in that graph. And the red wiggly line um, down at 25%, that was where it was this time last year. And then if you go a little bit further, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, if you go back to January 2020 at that lowest point on that white line, I think it was around 7%. So that's the lowest it got to during um, that 2019-2020 drought. Um, so it's amazing to see just how much that has changed just in 24 months. So now we're going to move forward in time. Instead of looking behind, we're now going to look forward. And these are our, um, our rainfall and temperature outlooks. So I don't know how familiar people are with these. There are possibly some people that look at these pretty regularly. Um, maybe they're new to, to others. Um, this is what we produce um, for um, our seasonal outlooks for rainfall and temperature. So we look at, look at both maximum temperature and minimum temperature and rainfall on the right. We produce them for the weeks, fortnights, months and seasons ahead out to, a, um, to four months ahead. Um, so it's that period beyond the seven day weather forecast. Um, you can see that link up in the top right where you can go into and um, just click on whether you're interested in rainfall and then you click on what period you're looking for. The green maps just give an indication of how well the model does at forecasting temperature or rainfall at this time of year. So that's what the green maps are. The greener they are, the more skillful they are or the more um, accurate they are. So these maps are for December. Um, you can see that in um, the, the rainfall map there on the right, there's an increased chance of seeing above normal rainfall across much of the east coast. And I have just taken a little look at that map and I, it, it, this, our model updates every, every day and it has actually enhanced that wet signal. So it does look reasonably washed out there. The odds um, aren't particularly strong, but just in recent, week, uh, recent days that has strengthened a little bit. So we are looking at seeing increased rainfall across much of the east, but a drier than average outlook for parts of the west. Um, down in Victoria, we're seeing mostly neutral outlook there. So no strong shift towards it being a particularly wet December or a particularly dry. Temperatures generally are warmer than average, a little bit of a cold signal or cooler than average signal in East and New South Wales. Looking at the three month December to February period, we're seeing that wet signal strengthen a little bit across, um, across the Eastern parts, perhaps a little bit even in uh, Victoria as well. But typically La Nina, as we move into summer, the the signal starts to move north. So we start to see more of that wet signal in the northern parts of the country. Looking even further ahead, the rainfall outlook doesn't change too much, but you can see that we are still seeing that wet signal in the east, very warm overnight temperatures. And that's something that we typically see also during La Nina, we have that extra cloud at nighttime. We don't see those really clear nights where we lose a lot of heat to radiation. Um, we've got cloud that keeps in that, that heat overnight. So that's a very typical La Nina type response. And that's also why we typically see these prolonged heat waves as well, because heat waves take into account not just the daytime temperatures, but also those overnight temperatures, because 
without that relief at night, it does start to build up um, in, um, in terms of its impact on human health. And February to April, you can see that wet signal just across the north. And I just pulled this one out today and that's just taking a sneak peek at the Christmas um, period. So we've got the fortnight 18th to the 31st of December and that's the only outlook we have for Christmas at this stage. But we'll obviously, as the, the weeks draw closer, we'll be able to get a bit more of an, um, an indicator of exactly what will happen on Christmas Day. But this is showing that that fortnight, that last two weeks of December, for Victoria at least, is looking like being a cooler and mostly wetter than average um, fortnight. So I don't know, maybe some people are happy with that outlook if they're planning on cooking a roast and um, um, yeah, perhaps not going to the beach and having a swim. I don't know. I, I think I t t tend to prefer the slightly cooler than average um, Christmas days. Okay, so this is one of our first um, new products that I thought I'd um, let you in on. Um, so this is a sample of our Climate Outlooks interface. Maybe some people have seen it already, um, but we have something new on that um, interface now, and that's the chance of extremes. So we had a lot of requests, um, particularly from agriculture, and this um, product, new product was um, financed by um, the Australian government's rural R&D for profit program. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of um, farming communities, um, industry groups saying that they wanted to know, they, they didn't really care about average rainfall or getting above or below average rainfall. They wanted to know if it was gonna be particularly wet or particularly dry or particularly hot or particularly cold because those, those extremes are what really impacts um, their, um, their farming um, cycles. So, and farming decisions. So this is something that addresses that request. So it shows the chance of being unusually wet or unusually dry and the same for temperatures, unusually hot and unusually cold. And when we say unusually, it means that top 20% of historical records. So the chance of being in the top 20% of all rainfall observations for a particular location or the bottom 20%. So this map here, it's just a sample, it's not the latest map, it's just um, there to show you what it can look like. Um, those green areas down in um, Victoria um, show that the chance of getting unusually wet conditions is about twice the normal likelihood. So we're seeing um, you know, a greater chance of getting unusually wet conditions for those darker green parts of the country. And when you click on a particular location, you get even more information. So you get a little pop-up um, graph that gives you an idea of, of the rainfall dis distribution. So what the chances are of being in that really top um, um, heavy rainfall bucket compared to being in the bottom 20% um, of rainfall totals. It also, in fact, I think, oh yeah, here we go. So here's a bit of a um, expanded version of that pop-up graph that comes up and that's on a five kilometer grid. So you can get quite tailored information there. It gives you the median, what you'd expect for this time of year, and then the chance of being unusually dry or the chance of being unusually wet. So there's quite a lot of information to take in there, but we do have lots of these little eyes all, all over um, our um, Outlook page where you can click on and find out a little bit more information. So it's something worth going into, clicking on a few buttons and having a play um, just to see what, um, what information you can find out. So it is something that will really help with making decisions and doing that longer term planning. Um, these are the current maps for December. So the chance of being unusually wet or unusually dry, the significant signal there is in Eastern New South Wales where we're seeing the chance of getting unusually wet um, conditions about twice the normal likelihood. These are the temperature maps. So um, once again, the, the strongest signal there, you can look in Western Tasmania, we're seeing the chance of getting unusually hot conditions. Um, on the graph, it's showing at around three to 3.5 times the normal likelihood. So Tassie is in for a fairly um, dry and fairly um, hot uh, December. All right, so then we're moving on to another new product. And I'm ho hoping I'm not bombarding you too much, but once again, the link's there if you do wanna go in and just do this in your own time. 
Um, this is um, now looking at our Australian water outlook. So we've gone through our rainfall and temperature seasonal outlooks. This product now gives us an outlook for, um, for the water in our landscape. So we can look at um, soil moisture outlooks or runoff outlooks or evapotranspiration. Um, this is the latest uh, um, soil moisture outlook. At the moment, I've got it clicked on um, December. And I've also zoomed in on the Compaspe um, River um, uh, catchment. So um, the graph on the right gives you an indication of what the outlook is in terms of soil moisture for that area, for that region, the Campaspe River region. Um, the boxes show the spread in the outlook. So the black line is the median. So if you only look at one thing, you look at the black line for December, it's showing that rainfall is in that blue section, which means it's likely to be above average um, soil moisture during December. Um, January is likely to be the same and February um, back towards more, more normal type values. Um, I did look at a few places in New South Wales that are well up into this top 10% of records um, for December. So looking like being extremely wet in those areas, M many areas that are already seeing um, floods. Um, and the black lines uh, for September, October and November are just the observations for that. Uh, for that area. But once again, it's something that you can go into and just have a little play around, click on different things and just see what it does. The other thing about this page, which is really handy, if you look up in the top left corner, there are three different um, things you can click on. It's currently on forecast, but you can click onto historical and go back and look at what it was doing this time last year or three months ago, or you can click on projections and then look further ahead. And that's looking at um, decades ahead as well. So you've got all your um, water information, whether it's past, present or future, all in this one product. So it's a really um, amazing interface that has a lot of information um, and it's really something you've just got to go in and just have a play around. I'm still actually getting used to it as well, just seeing what's there, what's available. So it's really just a snapshot what I've presented here. And so that brings me to projections. So now we're looking at um, even further. And I thought we'd start on the same um, interface. So we're still looking at the Australian water outlook, but I've clicked on projections. So up in that top right, um, top left corner. I've also clicked on 2030, but there are some other options there too. I think there's 2030, 2050 and 2070. So you can click on, um, you know, you can, you can tailor it for what you want to, to look at, whether you want to look at that sort of next decade or so, or if you want to look a lot further into the future. Um, you can click on different um, catchments, you can click on um, different emission scenarios. Um, so that's if we curb our emissions and we keep um, global warming um, to around the 1.5 um, degree mark. Or if that doesn't happen and we keep going as we are, that, that would be more like your RCP 8.5 emission scenario. So that would give you more significant changes. But you can have a play around and see what impacts that's likely to have on um, uh, the run, I've got runoff selected here, but it would also give you the same output um, for soil moisture um, and precipitation. Um, yeah, so you can look at the absolute change, which is the actual values themselves or the relative change. So at the moment, um, it's looking at, uh, I think, yeah, it's the relative change. So how different from normal it's likely to be. Um, yeah, once again, I really encourage you just to, to go in if you're wanting to find out information on um, projections of soil moisture into the future, then this has got the most up to date information um, that uh, for those um, uh, variables that you can you can find and in such a great interface, it's really uh, quite a useful tool. Um, and then this one I've just dropped in so that what did we have? before we had the runoff and this is just a similar sort of map but for root zone um, soil moisture and I've selected the RCP 8.5. So you can see quite a dry, um, a drying off of the landscape in a high emission scenario um, for, um, for soil moisture um, by 2030. 
and that's looking at annual. I think you can pick seasons as well. There's quite a lot of um, in interactivity that you can do to, to really zoom in and focus on what you're interested in. The other thing we can look at in terms of um, how um, how rainfall and temperature has changed over over time and how it's likely to change further into the future. The Bureau um, every two years puts out a report called the State of the Climate. And that just gives a summary of what's been happening in Australia in terms of those longer term trends. So this one, this map just shows how temperature, um, surface air temperature across Australia has changed over the last uh, century or so. Um, you can see um, in the orange, there is the land surface temperature, but the blue is also showing um, sea surface temperature for the um, Australian Ocean um, regions. Um, yeah, it's pretty easy to see that trend there. And um, in particular, um, that la late latest value of 2019 showing just how high above any other year um, it was. So quite a remarkable year. Um, I think I mentioned it before, on average, Australia has warmed um, by about one and a half degrees um, since um, national records began in 1910. Um, and that's also led to not just increase in temperature, but just an increase in the frequency um, and severity of extreme heat events. Looking at rainfall, this map shows how rainfall has changed um, during that April to October period. So those cooler months of the year, we've been seeing a drop in rainfall across much of Southern Australia. Um, in the Southeast, um, this has been calculated to be about 12% um, reduction in rainfall um, since the, the late 1990s. Um, and that has also led to a decrease in stream flow um, at the majority of stream flow gauges across southern Australia since 1975. Looking at um, fire weather days, um, so there's been an increase in extreme fire weather, um, the length of the fire season, and um, that is across much of the country, um, but particularly in parts of the southeast um, since the 1950s. Um, and this was an interesting graph that someone shared with me. It's not the, the highest quality graph, but it's showing how there's been um, much shorter break between big fire um, seasons. So you can see back in the 60s and 70s, there was a 15 year break between these really severe um, fire seasons. And this is for Victoria. But more recently, they're happen happening more and more often. So you only get that four year break or a two year break or even just a one year break. So there's really not that recovery time between big bushfire events. And this is just a summary of what um, future changes are likely for Australia. So continued um, warming temperatures, continued sea level rise, marine heat waves more frequent, um, heat waves more frequent and more severe, longer fire seasons. It paints a fairly dire pi <laughs> picture, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, climate isn't always a happy story, unfortunately. Um, yeah, heavy rainfall typically comes in more intense bursts as well, which has also been shown by the IPCC reports too. Um, and the interesting one, fewer tropical cyclones, but they tend to be of greater severity. So just speaking of IPCC, I thought I'd just really quickly throw this in. Once again, it's quite a big report. There is a summary report, which can just have the, a, a summary of their findings, which can be useful if you're wanting to look or find out a little bit more about how um, the climate is changing across the globe. I've put a link there to find out more if you are interested in following that one up. Um, one of the graphs that I do um, like to refer to in terms of the IPCC report, and this was um, the latest report came out in um, August of this year. Um, so this graph here shows global surface temperature and how it's risen um, since 1950. And the hottest year on record globally was 2016. And I've thought I'd just drop in, you know, where, whoops, where we are, um, where that is, where that sits. Um, so that's that's a roughly 2016 there. These are the projections and they're projections based on different emission scenarios. So if we keep emitting lots of carbon dioxide, we'll follow um, this high dark red line. If we do curb our emissions and keep um, to that 1.5 degree goal, um, such as was talked about at COP26, 
we'll stay on this light blue line here. But even still, that light blue line there, and that's our sort of um, best case scenario, it's still above our hottest year on record. So if you think back to say 2019 for Australia um, and just how that felt in terms of bushfires, smoke, dust storms, heat, um, and all the impacts that went with that, that it will still be that will seem like a cool year, I guess, in, in all of these scenarios. So that sort of puts things a little bit in perspective. And yeah, fairly, fairly sobering, really, when you think about it. Um, anyway, well, let's go back to Australia rather than looking globally. We're going to head back to Australia. And this is our final new product that I'm going to talk about um, tonight. Um, and it's actually really exciting. It's so new, it's not actually available yet, um, but we do have a demo site. So you can actually go in. Um, not many people have access to this, but I got special permission to share it. Um, please, at this stage, don't take any photos. It's that new that we don't want, um, want any um, leaks before it gets launched, um, which is uh, in about a week's time. Um, but there is a demo site there. And so that's the link there. There's a username and password you can use. It doesn't have quite the capability of the official site that will go out next week, but it has pretty much the same um, information there, um, just a slightly cut back version. Um, but also there's a little feedback button on there. So if you do go in and have a play, please, um, please send us some feedback. So this site, similar to our Australian Water Outlook, um, it's called Climate Services for Agriculture. It may have a name change before it gets launched, I'm not sure. So it's been developed um, through um, the, uh, the drought fund, um, um, through the Australian government anyway, um, to assist um, farmers to get a, um, a gauge or the agricultural community, community to get a gauge on their current climate, their past climate and their future climate. So um, I just, um, took a few screenshots um, from this new interface um, and um, put in um, Clinton as my, um, my location selection. It um, automatically brings up a graph of um, rainfall for the Clinton region um, back to, I think that must be 1960. So it gives you just your annual, um, annual rainfall, but it also breaks it down into seasons. You can click on um, each season. And that um, also gives you a little bit more information here in terms of the tables to the right. So it gives you um, what the, your 1961 to 1990 average is, um, what the more recent average is, and then what your um, future average is likely to look like. Um, you can also, um, like the Australian Water Outlook, the interface I showed you earlier, you can choose a different um, outlook period. So you can choose 2050, 2070 as well. And there, um, once you get onto here, you can then click to view the different charts associated with that data and find out even more information. Um, so this gives, um, breaks down that data um, even more. Um, we can get a little bit more of an indication of how the rainfall might change over the coming decades. Um, the orange, well, let's start with the blue lines, that's past. So that's sort of what we typically have seen um, in the 30 years, 61 to 1990. Then I talked about how we've seen rainfall across Southern Australia um, uh, decrease slightly in recent decades. So that's where we've see, we see this second blue graph that's showing a slightly um, lower annual rainfall total. Then the next ones, the yellow and the red um, for 2030, the yellow is a low emissions or a medium emissions scenario and the red is a high emissions scenario. And the same for 2050 and then 2070. Um, then uh, yeah, the same graph there um, on the right um, is for autumn rainfall. So um, you can see um, if you're looking at the 1961 to 1990, it was, I think you can actually get these values. I haven't got them here, but you can see that that annual autumn, well, that autumn rainfall used to be around the 160, 170 millimetre mark. It's dropped down to about 140 in recent decades. And it's likely to stay roughly the same. According to the projections, it is likely to stay roughly that level, perhaps dropping slightly 
um, in the high emission scenario. Um, you can also get the information for temperature as well. So um, this is looking at past annual average maximum temperature for Kyneton. You can see that same breakdown um, for the past average, the recent average, and a future average. Um, and once again, you can click on these things and get uh, much more information. The second column there is referring to minimum temperatures. So um, a much um, more consistent or um, expected um, trend there um, in terms of getting warmer as you go further into the future. Also, um, you can see that broken down now into 2030 um, uh, medium and high emissions scenarios, 2050 and then 2070. So quite a big step up as you get to a high emissions scenario in 2070. The other thing with this site um, is you can um, select a commodity. So it will um, bring up um, particular commodities for certain areas. So for this one, I selected Apple. Um, Jason's taken me to a, an Apple orchard not far from his place in Harcourt. So that's what caught my eye when I was looking at um, what to choose for this example. But um, when you click on those commodities, it brings you up information related to that um, specific um, farming arena. So um, Obviously with apple growing, the spring frost risk um, is something that um, is um, of particular importance to growing and also the sun damage. So it looks at the number of days where minimum temperature is less than zero degrees and how that might change over time. And also the number of days where the maximum temperature is likely to be above 32 degrees and how that is likely to also change over time. And then it's, you can see that graphed as well in terms of past spring frost risk. Um, and once again, displayed in terms of those medium and high emission scenarios for 2030, 2050 and 2070. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know enough about apple farming, but whether um, a, re um, a reducing number of um, spring frost um, is likely to be a good thing. So maybe perhaps there is a slight silver lining somewhere there in um, our climate change projections, but potentially um, offset by the future sun damage. Um, all right, I'll keep moving along. Oh, this was another one I just thought I'd take a quick look at. Um, this commodity I selected was the, for southern beef um, and um, actually in Mildura. Um, but it looks at um, heat wave conditions and what the frequency is likely to be um, over those time periods. All right, well, that brings me to the end. Our communications team does like us to finish with this slide to um, encourage you to connect with the Bureau through whatever platform you like, but they all, um, all of these do bring um, the latest information, the latest forecast warnings, climate outlooks, um, in, including um, links or information about our new products. We do try and do um, little explainer videos um, as much as possible to help um, people understand and use our new products too. So it is good to keep up to date um, with our latest announcements through these platforms. Um, but at this stage, I'll, I'll put my email address there too, in case you do have any follow up questions, but I'm happy to take some questions now too, if anyone has any. Thanks Felicity. Uh, so the floor is now open for people to either ask a question in the chat or um, put your hand up using the features down the bottom with uh, where, where you can look and see reaction. Um, so the first question in, oh, there's lots of questions coming in now, Felicity. So uh, mm -hmm. the first, can you see the chat feature or do you want me to go through I them? I can. All right. No, I've just found it. Um, and apologies, I, um, I've probably been doing lots of hand motions, assuming you can see me, but for some reason my video gets turned off when I share my screen. So. Um, now I'll can, do my we, best. We can take the share screen off now and you can, we can okay. then see you. All right, I'll do that unless there's anything that needs me to go back to a certain slide, but I, I can share yep. again. Let's see if I can stop sharing. All right, 
there we are. Um, all right, so our cyclones coming south. Um, yeah, so actually that is in um, the IPCC report that the tropics are expanding. So we are typically seeing um, on average, um, tropical cyclones are extending further south than they used to. I don't think they'll be crossing um, Victoria anytime soon. But like I said before, um, we do, um, it's not unusual to see ex tropical cyclones track um, south and bring um, significant rainfall um, to parts of the south. Um, I'm actually located in Newcastle and we had a similar um, uh, event. Oh, it must have been back in 2013. I think um, a cyclone, um, extropical cyclone, just tracked down the New South Wales coast. Um, Oswald, I think it was. Um, and it, yeah, brought um, huge amounts of rainfall and widespread flooding in Newcastle and across much of um, eastern New South Wales. So even um, though it's not um, officially a tropical cyclone, um, you can still get um, get impacts um, as they track south and, and weaken. They can still have quite a lot of moisture um, in them. And I guess that's something um, also that climate change has an impact on. We do, um, we are likely to see more of these extreme um, rainfall um, events. Um, <clears throat> so a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. So when you have a system that is um, going to bring some rainfall in a warmer world, it's likely to be more severe and have more water available to um, to, to to rain out. Yeah. Um, how do you measure soil moisture? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so our, we have a water team that puts out the soil moisture um, outlooks and observations. Um, I'd have to get back to you on that one. It could be um, satellite measurements, um, but I'll, I'll have to take that one on notice and get back to you. Um, what effect is climate change having on the climate drivers? Um, that's another great question. So, um, um, Different, for different drivers, the SAM, there does seem to be a positive trend in terms of SAM. So we are seeing more positive events than negative. So that means um, the fronts that typically cross um, Southern Australia and Victoria get drawn south towards the poles. So we have a strengthening polar vortex that brings down those, those fronts. And during the winter months where you typically rely on those rainfall systems to bring your winter rainfall, they get um, pulled further south and um, don't impact on the land mass themselves. So they could, that positive phase of the sand can um, have quite a big impact on winter rainfall um, just by drawing those, those fronts um, to the south and it just rains over the water or Tassie might pick up a bit of what rainfall might in, in originally have been going towards Victoria. Um, the Indian Ocean Dipole, um, the long-term trend has also been towards a more positive phase. So that would typically be a drier um, phase. So both of those can bring um, drier than average conditions to um, much of um, Australia. Um, uh, and in terms of El Nino and La Nina, um, it's a bit of a tricky one. I don't know that there is um, really strong signal um, there. Um, it's, it's actually quite tricky. It's something we've been talking about um, with this La Nina. Um, when you're seeing ocean temperatures warming and we measure La Nina by um, cool anomalies in the um, tropical Pacific, and we have certain thresholds that we look at to say, yes, we're in a La Nina or not. But as that, um, the oceans are warming, it's actually harder to hit these thresholds. So even though we might be seeing a La Nina event, um, they're actually harder to recognise. So we've got to sort of change our thresholds or change our base period to define what is a La Nina. Um, but I think what they do typically say, though, is even though um, La Nina events might be slightly weakening um, in terms of the signal that we see in the Pacific, we're still likely to see um, stronger rainfall impacts. Um, what else have we got? How will higher altitudes be affected by climate change? I'm at 700 metres above sea level. Um, well, um, 
probably warmer temperatures, less likelihood of snow. I, don't, I guess you'd probably get um, the odd dusting of snow, but I guess that will become less frequent. Um, yeah, I think it probably it probably varies a lot exactly where you are. I think you can um, be guaranteed that yeah, temperatures are, are going to be um, warmer. Um, in terms of how rainfall might change, it really depends um, where you are. Um, you know, whether you're in a, a rain shadow that would um, normally miss out on um, the, the frontal rainfall. It's, yeah, it's, it's really quite tricky to say. Um, I mean, we do a little bit of work with the ski resorts in terms of snow levels, but I think you're probably not high enough to, for any of that to be of um, use to you. Um, yeah, might have to get back to you on that one too. Um, can you explain how farmers can use this information to make decisions going forward, i.e. the changes in product? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so there's, there's probably a few different um, ways that the information can be used. So um, I know working with grain farmers um, up around Tamworth, they would look at our seasonal outlook to determine, um, you know, how, how um, much to to sow, what to sow, you know, whether they would go, you know, go for all their paddocks or just one if it was looking like being a drier than average um, year. So they would look at the longer outlook for that sort of initial planning. But then they'd look at the shorter um, timeframes in terms of their farm on farm decisions. So things like um, spraying um, or working out when to harvest or um, that sort of information. Um, I guess the other thing that um, these days um, with the grids that are available from our outlooks, um, there are groups um, oh, such as the sheep CRC. Um, I know ABARES use them as well. The, the grids get fed into um, crop uh, models so they can get an idea of, um, okay, um, if we get this much rainfall, what will that mean for, um, you know, for this grain region or, you know, what will the harvest look like if the commodity prices are this and, you know, they, they have their own modelling um, where they can use those inputs from our rainfall and temperature outlooks. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it, it really depends on sort of what sorts of decisions um, you're making on, on farm or on your property or for your business, um, how you can incorporate um, that information. Um, but as I said, there are the grids behind it. So if you are wanting to use actual values, you can um, get those values that can be fed into a sort of more algorithm type based um, decision uh, making model. So um, th thanks, Felicity. I'll uh, now stop the recording and thank everyone um, that's watched this video. But for the rest of us, we'll continue with some Q&A.